Joshua chapter 23 and Ephesians 4. We'll be in Ephesians 4 later in the message, but we'll primarily stay in Joshua. I just want to show you uh, something in Ephesians that corresponds with today's message. I'm not going to give a big background. We're just going to jump right into the word this morning. Um, if you if you don't know the story, or if you don't if you've never read the book of Joshua, you might be a little lost as to what is going on. But uh, Moses, God's servant, had died, and it was up to Joshua to take them into the promised land. And he says, "I'll be with you. I'll be wherever, whithersoever thou goest. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna conquer all your enemies as long as you uh, stay with me. You trust me. I'll take care of you." And Joshua did. Uh, Joshua is at the uh, end of his life here in in chapter 23. Uh, much conquering has already happened, uh, but there's still some land and, and much land that still needed to be conquered uh, as he's dividing it up to the um, tribes there. Each individual tribe got their own piece, uh, except the Levites, obviously, they didn't have any because God was their inheritance. Um, and so we'll just start in verse one here, and we're going to read through the whole chapter uh, through the message, not all at one time. It says in verse one in Joshua chapter 23, and it came to pass. A long time after the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about, that Joshua waxed old and stricken in age. And so uh, now that kind of tells you it's already been a, a long time after the Lord had already given rest to Israel um, from all their enemies <clears throat> all over the place where their inheritance was. And Joshua now is waxing old and stricken in age. It was unlike Caleb who was... Uh, 80 something years old. He says, my strength is still there. I'm still in the prime of my youth, just like Moses was. Uh, but Joshua, he's getting a little old and uh, he led the conquest and uh, uh, Joshua had grown uh, to about, uh, he would die at about 110 years old and a uh, very ripe, ripe young age. Amen. Uh, verse two, he says, and Joshua called for all Israel and for their elders and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers and said unto them, I am old and stricken in age. Don't you love when a man of God calls a meeting, he says, hey, I just want to tell you all I'm old, right? <laughs> uh, but really, all the representatives of the tribes were present. And uh, this is more of a, uh, to me, it's a more of a personal meeting. Although all Israel was there, uh, but he especially wanted to have all the elders, all the heads, all the judges, uh, so that way, and all the officers, because he's going to lay a charge on them and tell them what, what they need to do to make sure the people do what they need to do. And that's usually how it goes in leadership, uh, especially in the military. They'll tell the uh, uh, the officers, uh, the, the head guy in charge, will tell the officers what to do. The officers will pass it down to the enlisted, and then they go give a, a speech or something. And you got to sit there for three hours and listen to them. Right? <laughs> uh, so all the representatives of the tribe uh, tribes are present. Uh, when you get into chapter 24, uh, they were also all presenting, but it was a little different because Joshua took them uh, to Shechem to present all themselves uh, before the Lord. Uh, in chapter 23 here, Joshua is talking to them more like a heart-to-heart -heart, uh, kind of deal. Chapter 24 would be more, um, trying to think of the word, it would be more... Uh, ceremonial kind of type because you're doing it before the Lord. And chapter 23 is a, a little bit more personal. This is coming from uh, this is coming from God, but it's for, coming from the man of God from his heart. Um, and he just um, states some facts in verse three. He's, he reminds them of God's faithfulness and God's goodness. He says, "And ye have seen that all that the Lord your God hath done unto these nations because of you." For the Lord your God is he that hath fought for you. He says, Behold, I have divided unto you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes from Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off even unto the great sea westward. And that would be the Mediterranean. And so um, he's just kind of reminding the people, uh, all Israel, with all the heads of the tribes and things, and saying, look, you've seen everything that God has done. Uh, you've seen that uh, he's fought for you. Uh, he's omnipotent. He has loving kindness. He has goodness. Uh, he's full of grace. And um, I have divided, Joshua speaking, he says, I've divided unto you all the inheritances, how God wanted me to do that. And then he reassures him of God's promises. In verse 5, it says, And the Lord your God 
he shall expel them from before you. Uh, that's an indication that there's still some that are occupying that need to be uh, uh, driven out of the land. And he says, and drive them out from your sight, and ye shall possess their land as the Lord your God hath promised you. And so God is going to expel these um, um, people uh, in the land that was given unto the children of Israel from before you. It's gonna, he's going to drive them out of your sight. You're going to possess their land uh, just how God said that he would. Why? Because God is always faithful and God is immutable. He never changes. And so because of what God has done in keeping his promises and staying faithful, now Joshua is going to command them or warn them something in verse 6. He says, and be therefore very courageous. Uh, that's, a, that's a reoccurring word in the book of Joshua uh, because I believe Joshua suffered from some uh, timidity just like T uh, Timothy did. Uh, he says, be very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses that ye turn not aside from, uh, uh, from to the right hand or to the left. And he says, and in, 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 uh, um, uh, we'll just stop there in verse 6 and, and, and park there for a minute. He says, I want you to be sure that you're going to be very courageous. Why? Uh, because when you get in the occupation, although you've already taken over some land, although you've already uh, divided some inheritance, although you uh, maybe set up shop in a few areas, there's still some left to be done. So you can't get complacent because God's not through with you yet. And it's the same thing in your Christian life. You can't get complacent because God ain't through with you yet. Uh, there's a little song that we used to sing as kids, and it was called God's Still Working on Me to Make Me What I Ought to Be. It took him just a week to make the moon and stars, the sun and the earth, and Jupiter and Mars. Right? How, how loving and patient he must be, God's still working on me. Right? So don't judge me yet. Right? <laughs> And so God is just saying, I want you to, or Joshua is telling the people, he's like, I just want you to know that you need to be very courageous. You need to keep all that is written in the book of the law. Don't turn aside to the right hand or to the left hand. Stay right in the middle with God. He says, although we're almost to the end, and surely this morning we're almost to the end. Uh, Jesus is soon to return. He says, stay right in the middle. Stay right on the path. Keep working for God. Keep walking by faith. Don't go to the right. Don't go to the left. Don't get discouraged. Be very courageous because it's going to be a rough time. So he says in verse uh, 7 here, or, or sorry, verse 6 here, he wants you to keep, uh, meaning he says keep the law of Moses. That means to guard. And then he says keep all that is written, uh, or sorry, keep and to do. So we are to guard what we know of the word of God. We are to proclaim truth. We're to guard truth or to proclaim truth. And then he says to do, and that means to practice uh, or to perform. Uh, don't just be hearers of the word of God, but doers of the word. And he says all that is in the law, not cherry picking verses and doing this and doing that, but doing everything that God says. Uh, and so consistency is key in the Christian life. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4, uh, uh, 4 verse 2, uh, uh, moreover is required in stewards that a man be found faithful, right? In 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 15, he says, uh, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, because you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so consistency and faithfulness to God uh, doesn't happen on accident. It's a purposeful thing. It's something, it's, it's a daily choice to either follow self or follow the Lord. And Joshua is just reminding these folks, and, and what James would remind us in the New Testament, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. I don't know if I need to do this. I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about this. Relax, and why don't you ask God for some wisdom, amen? And then he gets into verse 7, and he says this, That ye come not among these nations, these that remain among you, neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow yourselves unto them. And so he lists some actions for God's people uh, to uh, refrain from. And the first one, uh, if, if he says, don't come among these nations. If, if they would refrain from the first one that, that Joshua lays out there, uh, because the other ones are, are dominoed right after it. 
uh, if you come among them, uh, it says, I don't want you to come among those people that remain around you or among you. Uh, don't mention the name of their gods. Uh, don't cause anyone to swear by them. Uh, don't serve them and don't bow down to them. And we see a principle here in the word of God called separation. Separation. Uh, God's people are not to be separate because of their nationality. Uh, the, the, otherwise, we wouldn't have churches. We wouldn't have worldwide missions. Uh, it is, we're not to be separated because of our skin color. Uh, we're not to be separated because of our social economic status or our income class. Uh, God wanted his people to be separate from other nations. Why? Um, because of the spiritual nature in which other nations uh, were accustomed to is contrary, uh, opposite, 180 opposite from what God commands his people to be. And so he wanted them separate in reference to the religious practices of the heathen. Um, and the false deities that would eventually draw away the hearts of God's people. And so, number one, we don't need to study every religion under the sun to understand what they believe so we could be a better soul winner. Uh, we, need just, we just need to stick with the Bible. Uh, we, don't, we, 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 don't, uh, we just need to understand God's word. We need to know it so much like the back of our hand so that we can defend our faith. My job isn't to defend anyone else's faith, but my faith. Amen. Amen. And so uh, we can know some basic tenets of other faiths. It's not bad. I believe that's wise to do in evangelism. But I certainly don't have to read every book <coughs> that slanders Christianity. I don't have to see uh, every article that comes out that blasphemes my Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't have to read anything that uh, continues to diminish the King James Bible. Uh, and we don't need the answer to everything that's thrown our way because we have the answer right here. We may not know it right away. We can study it out, but the book always has the answer. Uh, you don't need to know every religion to go out soul winning. Uh, last time I checked, the Great Commission says, Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel, right? Go into every creature and preach the gospel. Uh, it doesn't say go and learn all the religions and let them teach you and then try to defend your faith. It doesn't say that. It just says, Go and tell the gospel, go and preach the gospel. Secondly, Joshua would say, uh, don't come among these nations that remain among you, ne neither make mention of their gods. Um, we, there's some things in our Christian life, speaking in, in separation, that principle, that you ought not talk about as a Christian. Uh, we don't talk about pagan, pagan practices. We don't talk about idolatry uh, and the methods used to open up the mystic occultism and all those things and satanic black magic. Uh, we don't need to talk about divorce in our households. Uh, that's a word that doesn't need to be mentioned or things done in the dark because the Bible says in Ephesians 5 and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Don't even, don't even fellowship with those things. He says, but rather reprove them uh, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Uh, we don't talk about vulgar things. Surely we don't swear. We don't use bad words. Ephesians 4 says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying that may minister grace unto the hearer. Thirdly, Joshua would say, um, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them nor bow yourselves unto them. So these kind of last ones kind of intermingle together. Uh, the Bible says, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Uh, we shouldn't be making any honorable mention of false deities um, or occultist practices. Uh, when we're talking with someone who believes in another God, yes, you can be respectful. Uh, yes, but we don't want to give any credence. We don't want to give any honorable mention to Buddha or Krishna or Muhammad or any of those people. Why? Because they're false. They're false deities. Uh, I mean, Muhammad's not a deity, but they worship him like he is anyway, or they elevate him like he is. But either way, we don't need to speak good about false deities. Uh, we don't say. We don't say. We don't sit here and say, well. Uh, my zodiac sign is such and such, and that's the way I act because that's who I am because that's my sign. We don't talk like that as Christians. Uh, they introduce that stuff into, into Christian circles, which is very scary. Some people say my spirit animal is Eeyore. My spirit animal is Eeyore, so I'm bound to always be depressed. That's just who I am, right? But, but seriously, that stuff is absolutely wicked. They call that shamanism or uh, uh, what is it called? We were looking at Enneagrams, right? Stay away from that garbage. Uh, and we can, and when God says, uh, or sorry, when Joshua says, nor cause to swear by them, it, it really means that they were to be steadfast 
and the acknowledgement in the worship of God. Swearing isn't like, oh, I swear to God. It's, it's actually a form of, of acknowledgement and worship. And so um, we can worship and swear by these things like Enneagrams and spirit animals and all that garbage. Joshua says, don't have any part of that. Be separate from that. And then fourthly, Joshua says, neither serve them. Neither serve them. And most assuredly, we, don't, we should not be serving other gods. We shouldn't be serving other gods, but often we do it. You say, Pastor, not me. I, don't, I only serve the Lord. Ah, but let me ask you, you put your priorities above the Lord. When you put your priorities above the Lord, then who are you serving? Uh, when we put ourselves above the Lord, we're not serving God, we're serving self. And uh, when we put our conveniences in front of the Lord's commands and say, ah, it's, it's too hot or it's too cold, right? We're very finicky people. That sun's going to be burning on you. You're going to be like, Pastor, hurry up, my head's burning, right? Well, when we put our conveniences in front of the Lord's commands, we're not serving God. When we put our luxuries in top priority, uh, we're not serving God. When we hold our ego in high regards, we aren't serving God. Uh, when it comes to um, uh, uh, suffering and identifying with Jesus, we're not serving God. When we put our uh, ego in a high estimation, you know what ego stands for? Edging God out. That's your ego. You're edging God out. And then number five, Joshua says, nor bow yourselves unto them. So all three of these last ones kind of go, kind of kind of smush together there. Uh, if the first thing on your mind after work is dinner, that's fine. You're like, I thought he was going to say something bad. No, no, no. <laughs> But if, but if your next thought after dinner is, I can't wait to watch my, my favorite TV show for the next three hours or play that video game, then watch out because idolatry has gripped your heart. Uh, if we're giving more than four upwards of six hours, uh, researchers say, to our phones than we are to God, then we have a problem. Uh, if you can spend four hours a day on social media, emails, or browsing the Internet but can't give God 30 minutes of prayer and 30 minutes of Bible reading, uh, or any sort of time, shame on us. Uh, screen time over up, uh, overall is up 30% this year alone. On average, Americans spend four hours and 25 minutes a day on their phones compared to two hours and 25 minutes in 2022. I don't know if you caught that, but in 2022, it was roughly three hours. In 2023, now it's up to four hours. That's average. I don't even know if they put teenagers in there. But many respondents say they have their phones with them at all times. Uh, they, 60% said they sleep with their phones. Um, uh, 89% said they check them within the first 10 minutes of waking up. And then 75% said they use them while they're in the bathroom. So on average in 2023, people are checking their phones 144 times a day. 144 times a day. And I wonder how many times a day are we checking into God? How many times a day are we checking into God's word? How many times a day are we checking into God with uh, prayer and supplication? So when Joshua is coming here and he's saying, look, uh, uh, in verse 7, and he, let, he lists all those things, don't come among these nations. Israel was to have no civil uh, or social contracts with them because it will inevitably lead to spiritual affinities. Like, um, um, lost, his, uh, lost his name. Ahab and Jehoshaphat. Remember, Ahab and ah Ahab was a wicked king. Jehoshaphat was a good king. He made affinity with Ahab by giving his, uh, letting his son marry his daughter. And they had an affinity. They had a league. And so Joshua, in telling the leaders and all of Israel, hey, don't come among these nations. I want you to be separate. Uh, don't have any civil discourse with them. Don't have any social contracts with them. Don't let them marry your daughters. You don't give away your sons. He's like, stay away from them by all at all costs. And the consequences of which you'll, if if you don't do this, the consequences he says in verse seven, he's saying, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. He says that if you do do this, you'll make honorable mention of their gods. Um, you'll swear by them. You'll serve them. You'll bow down to them as your uh, creators and your preservers. Um, and all of this will follow just simply by coming among them. That's it. Uh, he who walks in the counsel of the ungodly uh, will soon stand in the way of sinners, in the seat of the scornful. Uh, Proverbs 4.14 says, Enter not into the path of the wicked and go not in the way of evil men. Then in contrast to those commands, those warnings, 
from Joshua, he says a great thing in verse 8. He says, but, and, and hinging on this, he says, cleave unto the Lord your God as you have done unto this day. Uh, this generation was a lot different than their parents' generation. The, the, the parents' generation was absolutely, Rodney, what is it? Stiff-necked. But this generation said, we are going to trust God by faith. We're going to follow God by faith. We're going to trust the leadership. We're going to trust God's word on this. And we're going to go forward and we're going to conquer. And that's absolutely what they did. So Joshua wasn't lying when he's saying, hey, y'all, just cleave unto the Lord your God as ye have done this day. You've been doing it since we were young. You saw what our parents did. You saw how, how bad they were. He's like, don't be like them. Cleave unto the Lord. Just continue cleaving to the Lord. And it's interesting that he says this. And why is that? Because when we talk about separation, if a pastor ever mentions separation, let me back that up. If a Baptist ever mentions separation, there's some people that do not like that word. Our word likes unity. They don't like the word separation. So when we talk about separation, many Christians only focus on the negative aspect of it. You know, like stay away from that. Don't do this. Don't touch that. Don't drink that. Don't put that needle in your arm. Don't smoke that. Don't drink that. Don't throw up that. Don't eat that. Like don't just don't do those things, right? We focus on the negative aspect of separation. Say no one's going to tell me what I can't do. No one's going to tell me how I have to how I can live my life. Yeah, no one can tell you that except God. God's the one that has the authority to do that because he created you and your puny brain. So we're not just separated for the sake of being separate. Don't say, well, I'm an independent Baptist and I'm just going to be separate from everybody and I'm going to humbug to the rest of the world. That's not what it is. We're not being separate just so we can look at others in a self-pious attitude and say, huh, I'm better than they are. That's not what it is at all. Uh, we are separated unto something. Uh, sure, we're separated from many things. That's the negative. But the positive is that we're separated unto God. We are separated unto God. Uh, there's nothing wrong with being separated unto God because uh, sanctification means separation. When you get saved and saving, right, God sanctifies you. You are completely, totally, eternally separated unto God. Absolutely. Uh, and to sanctify means to set apart or to consecrate, not removal of sin. The, the, the sanctification, the process of separation, does not try to renew the flesh. You cannot renew the flesh. That's why God rejects the first and he accepts the second. Because you can't renew this flesh. You need a new nature. And God gives you that new nature through the divine agency of the Holy Spirit. And there's two aspects of sanctification. There's positional, what we are in Christ, because when you get saved, He puts you in Christ, right? He says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and they shall never perish, right? Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand, right? So we're, 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 we're in Christ. And then the second uh, uh, aspect is that it's progressive, what we are becoming in Christ. Amen? And so uh, I'm sure I've said this a thousand times, but first, we're sanctified once and for all. God sees us in Christ as perfect because Christ is perfect. It is an imputed or a, a positional sanctification, the result of which Christ dying on the cross and shedding his perfect blood, whereby the believer is set apart unto God. All right, he takes, it's, it's the imputation, just like they did in the Old Testament. They would lay their hands, the sins of the people, on the goat or on the uh, lamb. And they would, uh, uh, um, uh, um, um, in an essence, would be putting their sin on that innocent lamb. Jesus, as the innocent lamb, would take our, when, when, when any sinner trusts Christ, he is taking their sin and he is imputing to them his righteousness. Amen. Uh, and so 1 Corinthians says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? It says, Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But then he says a great thing in verse 11, because he's writing to the church in Colossae there, or sorry, in, in Corinth, and he says, and such were some of you. 
This is that was your old life, but here's your new life. But you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. In Hebrews 13, it says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Progressive, so that's positional. Progressive sanctification uh, is our standing, not our state. Uh, what do you mean? Like I said a moment ago, uh, we're not trying to seek, we're not seeking to improve the flesh. You can't. You wash dirt, it becomes mud and it gets worse. And then you have to wash it off, right? Because that's how many kids you got in your house. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so what we are becoming in Christ is absolutely important to God. Uh, we are saints, but we don't always act saintly. Uh, there was a, a young man here that visited with us last week, and I was talking to him at his house uh, on Saturday the day before, and we were talking about this, and he doesn't he believes you can lose your salvation. I'm like, please show me in the Bible where it tells me how I can get it back if I lost it. And there's nothing in the Bible on that. Um, but I said that um, I, I gave him an illustration. I did the same thing with my kids. We were talking about sanctification the other day. And I said, um, when Noah, Noah built the ark, right? When no, What saved Noah? Was it the water? No, it was the ark. He was in the ark, which is a picture of, and the man I was talking to, he says, the church. I'm like, no, it's a picture of Christ. Christ. He's the one who saves, not the church. That's what's wrong with orthodoxy. Everything's in the church. No, it's in Christ. Everything's in Christ. And while Noah was on the ark with the waves going crazy, how many times do you think Noah fell? Probably a lot, but he never fell out of the ark. And many times you'll be, you are in Christ, you'll, you may fall down, but a just man getteth back up again. Because God gives you the power to keep on walking for him. You may get off the path a little bit, but you're always in the ark. If you're saved, you're saved and you know it. And your life will truly show it. Amen. So progressive sanctification is, is that we are saints. God never calls you a sinner again once you're saved. Uh, you are a saint of God, but you don't always act saintly. Uh, there may be something that comes out and we may go, blah, blah, blah. oh, sorry, that's not really me. No, no, that is you. That's the real you. But what you're saying is the old nature. And what we need to learn is to become more and more like Christ. And we say, God, forgive me. I didn't mean to say that. I didn't mean to act out in that way. I didn't mean to uh, show this person how great of a driver I am, right? And all these things, it doesn't get any greener. Um, but uh, nevertheless, God's will for us as believers is to be transformed and conformed to the image of Christ. That's what it is. He says um, in Romans 12 too, he says, be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal that the Lord knoweth them that are his. He knows if you're his and you know if you're his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity, that separation. Uh, and this is a process and it's a, it's a work of God. It's a present work of God in us through the application of the Word of God, um, by the operation of the Spirit. It is a, uh, it is a putting off and a putting on. Uh, you can't put on something if you haven't took off something first. And so that's just the principle in the Word of God. Uh, so then, now then, we're, we're to have a separation from the world, and we are to cleave to God. In 1 John, he says, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also, so to walk even as he walked. Uh, Jesus said in Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. We are not to be hypocritical, but we're to be uh, living biblical lives as Christ, our example. So when we get born again, we are changed. There's a change that happens when you become born again. And he says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son? Uh, there's a there's a calendar someone gave me, and it's not King James. It's a horrible, horrible perversion of truth written on there. I, I can't even quote it to you. It's so bad. But it's it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And I've read it, and I'm like, what is that? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen? So there's a change that happens. And so as much as we ever clave and held on to that old nature, it will never leave. But God, now God has imparted a new divine nature uh, through the Holy Spirit. And we must cleave to God with even more passion, with even more zeal, and even more faith. 
And that word cleave, when, when he says that in verse 8, but cleave unto the Lord your God, that word cleave means to impinge or to glue or to cling or to stick to, or I like this one, to follow hard after. Um, when you uh, first meet a, uh, uh, um, if you're a female, you first meet your husband, right? He's not your husband, but you're dating. Or if you're a guy and you first meet your future spouse, you're just like, I want to be with him all the time. I want, I want to, I want to stick close to him all the time. I want to hang out with him all the time. And what do you do? Do you, do you just like jet out both ways? No, no, you want to be close. Amen. You want to get to know this person. You want to hang out with them. You want to follow hard after them. God says, I want the same thing from you. I want you to follow hard after me. I want you to be so in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to be in so, so in love uh, that you would, you would just want to, you want to just envelop me. Right? You want to embrace and cling to and listen to. Right? You know, when you're on the phone, your first, your first, uh, uh, you know, you're dating for a while and you're talking on the phone. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. God says, I don't, I want, I don't want you to necessarily be like that, but I want you to cling to me. I, I want you, I want you to love me more than that person. Cause, cause what can happen is we can focus on our spouse so much and leave our relationship with God. We could focus on our family so much and leave our relationship with God. We can focus on our church so much and leave our relation with God. Uh, God says, I want you to cleave unto me. Joshua is just reminding the people, hey, you've been cleaving, now continue to cleave. I want you to cleave. I, this is what I, I, God desires of us, and this is what we should be doing. And so all the, and this clinging isn't just a one-time process, or isn't just a one-time event. We know that. It's a process. Amen. And same goes for our families. We just we don't just cleave one time. We continually grow. We continually develop. We experience life together. We do life together. That's what discipleship is. We grow in faith together. Uh, we go through war together because Satan attacks us. Uh, we go through hardships together. Uh, we learn to constantly cleave. And marriage is the same. The same word is used. In Genesis, he says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and, the, and he shall cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. It's not, nay, you may now kiss the bride, and then at year 12, forget about her. No, that's not what it is. It's a continual thing. And so I started thinking, I was like, if God is so concerned with our temporary, uh, our, yeah, our temporary passing relationships, how much more is he concerned with our eternal relationship and fellowship with him? absolutely he's concerned about it. If he's concerned about our relationships down here, he's absolutely concerned with his relationship with us. Amen? He says in verse 9, For the Lord hath driven out from before you great nations and strong, but as for you, no man hath been able to stand before you unto all this day. Unto this day. That's a, that's a good testimony. That's a testimony of the faithfulness of God's people and trusting God by faith. Remember, this, this whole year we've had the theme, Faith in Thee in 23, and it, nothing changes. You're still, just because it's a new year in 2024, don't mean you got to stop walking by faith. Oh, well, we got, we're on to a new theme now. Don't got to worry about faith. No, 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 it's still about faith. It's always about faith. Uh, so he just trying to tell them, he says, remember what the Lord has done for you. In verse 10, he says, uh, one, one, one man of you shall chase a thousand for the Lord your God. He it is that fighteth for you as he hath promised you. So remember, the Lord's doing it for you. Uh, God's fighting for you. And then he says in verse 11, an interesting thing that a lot of people don't find in the Old Testament, but it's all throughout. He said, Take good heed therefore unto yourselves that ye serve the Lord your God. No, no, no. That you worship the Lord your God. That you obey all the commandments of the word of God. He says, no, love. Love the Lord your God. Because if, if God has your heart, he'll have all of you. We have to give God our hearts. Uh, 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 my my son for Christmas, he uh, uh, drew this thing with mom and dad on the front, and I thought he drew a cat on my on my sweater on, on there, but it was a Christmas tree. So thank God. Uh, but he says, but he, but and he had, and, he, and he opened it up and he wrote a little thing like, hey, you two didn't know each other, then God bless you with me. You named me Harlan Mac Wandell on in December of 2020. I was like, well, I'm I'm glad he thinks he's only three years old. But anyway, uh, but then he had he had he had two little hearts in there. He says, I want you to have my heart. Amen. Because I tell him all the time, and, I, and hopefully he's grasping that concept, because what can happen? And I want my daughter to be, I want all my kids to be the same way. Mommy and daddy have your heart. 
If you give it to some little girl, she's going to do this and go crush it. And it happens. There's some of you in this room, your heart has been crushed. I have been blessed by God to never have a heart broken. I, I've met a wife who's been very, very good to me. And that's the only lady that I ever want to be with or ever desire to be with. And as she says, I've had my heart broken. I don't want your heart broken. I was like, good, let's never break up. Right? Let's never leave. Let's just stay together. And, and I want that for my kids. I want my kids to go to the marriage altar pure. I want my uh, daughter to be pure. I want my sons to be pure. And I want to have their heart. And God says, why don't you write up something and give me your heart? God wants your heart. Yes, he loves your obedience. Yes, he loves your, your faith. And, and, and that is kind of mixed in with this love and saying, God, I love you. Right? I, I, every, almost just about every night I quote Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 to my boys. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. God wants your heart. And so praise God, Joshua interjects this in here. He says, love the Lord your God. Remember that it's him that's done all these things. He's the one fighting for you. Love him for it. Verse 12, else if ye do in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you and shall make marriages with them and go in unto them and they to you... Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes until ye perish from off this good land with which the Lord your God hath given you. Ephraim and Harlan, would you guys like to have thorns in your eyes? That's crazy. Harlan, I didn't, I didn't mean to share that. Are you okay with me sharing that? Okay, good. You're 10. You're not, you don't get really embarrassed yet. Uh, maybe to, when 13, you're like, oh, man, what are you talking about my heart, man? I'll be careful next time. I don't usually bring my kids in the pulpit. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, he says, if, if, if you're going to go back, it, he says, else. And he says, do all these things, right? And then verse 12, he says, if you do in any wise, go back. And then he word, uses that word again, cleave. How you should be cleaving to God, how you are currently cleaving to God. If you go back and, and uh, cleave, verse 12, under the remnant of these nations, just know that God is not going to help you drive them out. They're going to be snares to you. They're going to be traps to you. They're going to be scourges. They're going to be thorns uh, until you perish from off the good land, which the Lord your God hath given you. Wow. He said, you, you know in your hearts and in your souls that God has not failed of any one good thing. Verse 14 says, and behold this day, I am going the way of all the earth. What is that? Round and round and the sun goes down? No, no, no that means going underground. Amen. And ye know that in all your hearts and in your souls, that not one thing hath failed of, of, of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you, all are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. That's a good testimony of God. That's a good testimony of God's faithfulness. He says, look, I, I just want you to know that everything you've been through, all the signs, all the wonders, all the miracles, all the uh, um, conquests, God has not failed you in one jot nor tittle. He says, I, I, God has continually carried you and borne you along uh, to where uh, here you are this day. I'm about to leave and you're still here, but I want you to continue to remember him. I want you to continue to cleave to him. I want you to know and love him because he is the one that has done it all. It is Jesus. It is Jesus. It is all Christ. Amen. In, in the beginning of Joshua, God says, he told Joshua, he says, I will never fail thee. I will not fail thee. Uh, he can't fail, right? And that's exactly what he meant. Uh, God is faithful, right? He who promised will bring it to pass. And, and then continuing on in verse 15, says, Therefore it shall come to pass that as all good things are come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so shall the Lord bring upon you all evil things until he have destroyed you from off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Joshua! What are you doing? We were going like this, man. You, this is your speech. And then all of a sudden you said, all good things must come to an end, right? Who knows that oldie song? What goes up must come, right? Some of y'all got it. I used to listen to oldies when I was a kid. Uh, what, whatever goes up must come down. He says, all good things that the Lord brought to you. And then if evil things, uh, and if you turn away from this, evil's going to come. Bad's going to come. Uh, Joshua, your speech was going so well, and you were going on a high point. You're going to go out in the flames of glory. And he says, hey, just know this. If you mess up, God's going to bring judgment. 
God's going God's gonna to do something here. And he says in verse 16, an interesting word. He says, he, he says, when ye have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God. He doesn't, he doesn't say um, if, but he says when. Uh, transgress, meaning disobey, like going beyond God's word, like going against that. Uh, wh- why does he say when? Because I believe that in the divine wisdom and discernment that was imparted to Joshua, he knew that once he was gone, only a few generations later would have passed and the people would forsake the counsel of the Lord. They'll say, hey, we're going to go our own way. We're going to forget God. And if you read through the book of Judges, this is their life, right? <laughs> All throughout the book. One of my favorite books of the Bible is Judges. But, but it only takes one generation uh, to slip or to loosen its grip or to stop cleaving to God and to cause the succeeding generations that are coming after us to follow the footsteps of their fathers and their mothers further into sin and further away from God and His Word and, and further away from the fundamentals of the faith. So we must be careful and we must be on guard. We must train our families. We must train our churches. We must be vigilant ourselves in cleaving to God because little eyes are watching. Uh, your life is no man liveth unto himself, no man dieth unto himself, the Bible says. Eyes in your circle of influence are watching every move you make. Your testimony is absolutely, uh, uh, um, uh, unequivocally important to God. Um, uh, think of um, Sennacherib when he came in Hezekiah's day with the, with the armies of Syria. And he says, no God can, withhold, can withstand us. We've, we've been delivered or we've been conquering and coming. And uh, don't trust in what Hezekiah says because Hezekiah understood something. He brought a revival in his day. And he started doing what? Tearing down the gods and the little groves all across the country. Sennacherib, thousands of miles away, said, don't trust in Hezekiah. Isn't he the one that took all your gods away? Your people are watching what you do. Here's a pagan, uh, uh, not a king, he was uh, speaking on behalf, but the, the, uh, the general of the armies, he knows what Israel was doing. He doesn't know that the God of Israel does it, is not made with hands. <laughs> he lives in something without hands. He created all of this. He says, don't trust in Hezekiah. So we have to be careful. We have to be vigilant and cleaving to God because people are watching, because the Lord is watching. All right, there's another little song they sing in Sunday school, Be Careful Little Eyes, What You See. Be careful little ears what you hear. Be careful little mouth what you say. Be careful little hands what they do. Be careful little feet where they go, right? Because the Father up above is looking down with anger. No, he's looking down with love. Oh, be careful little eyes what you see. Amen? Just as Joshua noticed a pattern in the lives of God's people, there's a pattern uh, today of once good, solid, fundamental churches uh, turning to the ideas of the world. They're watering down doctrine. They're changing doctrinal positions, extra biblical, non-biblical. They're flooding it, even anti-biblical, uh, even going apostate, right? And adopting the world's philosophy and dragging them into a building that they want to call church, but Jesus ain't in it. Where the Lord's standing on the outside and he's knocking saying, hey, can I come back in? Can I, can I come back into this church? Can I come back into this building so it can be a church? But they can't hear because of the blaring ohm music. They, don't, they, they won't hear because the itching ears they have for hedonistic ideologies, doctrines of devils hidden in a Christian facade. And Paul warned uh, Pastor Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 2, he said, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Whether, it's, whether uh, people like it or they don't like it, you need to preach it. Whether you don't like it, <laughs> you got to preach it. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come. Well, they not, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but will heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn their ears away from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. When Israel does rebel and go against the covenant, then the Lord will have his anger, anger kindled against her. Let's finish the verse in verse 16. When ye have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods, and bowed yourselves to them, then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you. Not against your enemies, against you, Israel. And ye shall perish quickly from off the good land which he hath given unto you. It says, God, if you turn from these things, if you transgress from this covenant that you've already given, if you stop cleaving to me, 
Just know my anger is going to come towards you. You may think it's all fun and games, but when daddy comes home, things are going to happen. And, and so the result, as I said a moment ago, they're going to perish off the land if they do these things. Quickly, from off the good land which he gave. Uh, God says, you didn't get this yourself. He says, I'm going to bring you into a land flowing with milk and honey. You're going to have vineyards that you didn't plant. You're going to have fruit trees you didn't plant. Uh, you're going to have houses you didn't even build. I'm just giving you this inheritance. You did nothing for it. Same thing in salvation. You do nothing to receive your salvation except believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, you weren't, I didn't choose you because you're, any, you're better than anybody else. He said, but because I love you. I chose to love you. And, 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 and we wouldn't know love had God not loved us first because God is love, First John says. And for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And God loved us even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, because he loves sinners, and he also loves his children. Folks, we need to choose to what verse 11 says, love the Lord your God. It's a conscious decision every day to love God, to serve God, to cleave to God, to walk hard after God. And we need to grasp in our hearts and minds uh, the concept of enjoying His presence and enjoying His love and benefits. Uh, and grow in His grace and grow in holiness and grow in sanctification in the power of His might. So why? So we could be more conformed to the image of Christ. So that we can be a better testimony to the lost people. I told you to hold your spot in Ephesians 4. Turn there with me and I'll, I'll close out with this. Ephesians chapter 4. Here in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, it's talking about some things. It's a sanctification, a progressive sanctification process. And remember, sanctification means separation. Sanctification means separation. Uh, chapter 4 of Ephesians in verse 21, he says, If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, that's the lifestyle, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Well, that's just how I am. No, 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 friend. You're a Christian. You need to walk as a Christian. You need to talk as a Christian. You need to think like Christ thinks. And he says, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you may put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And he would continue on in several other letters talking about sanctification. To sanctify means to... Uh, set apart to consecrate. It deals with our walk. It deals with our service. Uh, it deals with a, uh, it's a putting off. It's a putting on. It's a reckoning and it's continual and it's purposeful. God wants us to cleave to him more than the things of this world. He wants us to cling to him uh, more than the, our desires and the allurements of the world are extremely effective in pulling our attention away. They really are. They grab our attention. They can hold our attention. There are companies out there, um, uh, um, um, uh, money marketing companies out there who will offer their services and show you how long they can keep an individual's attention on their phone. One of the worst things that probably, uh, it's, it's a, it's a catch-22. I'd say one of the worst things to happen uh, to the older generation, I'd say 55 and probably above, is Facebook. Facebook cra grabs your attention so much and you, Three scrolls, you're in, right? My, my wife uh, tried to find an app on her phone. Uh, we don't really go on Facebook that much, just talk to friends or whatever. She says, three, three scrolls, and it locks you out. You're done. Said everybody needs that on their phone. Good grief, man. You spend all day on Facebook, right? And what, the, uh, a lot of social media, it can be used for the glory of God. There's not a lot of Christian influence on there. That's why we put our stuff on YouTube. Uh, probably need to get on Rumble and some other ones, right? But uh, we can get so bogged down and so um, uh, um, tr entrapped with the allurements of the world. It doesn't have to be social media. It could be anything. It could be, it could be our house. It could be our backyard. It could be our pets. It could be um, uh, our neighbor. It could be our family. It could be anything. It could be our spouse uh, that want to grab our attention and keep it and hold it. But God desires our fellowship. God desires our attention to be set on his son, Jesus Christ. In uh, Colossians 3.1, he says, set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. He's want, he wants our affections on Jesus Christ. 
And I know it's the start of a new year. Uh, we make physical goals. We make, I probably don't keep them very well, uh, but we know uh, we make family goals. We make spiritual goals, but let us not leave Christ out. Let us not leave Christ out. Don't leave him behind this new year because God desires that we continue in his word. He desires that we cleave to him, that we remember that what he's done for us and that we love him the more for it. Last verse and I'll, I'll close. I'll close my Bible. Jeremiah 13, 11 says this, For as the girdle cleaveth to the loins of a man, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, saith the Lord, that they might be unto me for a people, for a name, and for a praise, and for a glory, semicolon, but they would not hear. Christian, are you living a life that is separated unto God? Are you cleaving to Him or are you cleaving to the world? And today would be a great day to make a commitment to God for the new year especially, to cleave to Him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the message you laid on my heart, and I thank you for the, your people to be attentive.